indication that Brower was uh, totally dissatisfied with the set theoretic approach to topology. Uh, and that is quite significant since his mathematical contributions at that time uh, they were in topology, and it was as a topologist that he was recognized uh, uh, already then. Uh, so it seems to me that there is every reason to uh, take seriously uh, his approach to topology. Maybe we have something to learn from it. Uh, so that, interestingly enough, the term he used in 1918, uh, when he wrote in German, was Menge, set. Uh, and uh, seems very confusing because uh, set theory was established already since long ago, and he chose that term. Um, and uh, uh, he stuck to it uh, until he began to write in English uh, after the war, and then he turned uh, into this new term, spread, uh, which is uh, meant to translate Dutch, uh, spreading. Yeah. And, um, the fact that he called it set um, is presumably in itself very significant. I mean, it somehow shows that he thought that his intuitionistic mathematics should be based on this new notion of spread, just as uh, classical mathematics is based on set theory. And since uh, spread corresponds to the notion of topological space, it means that he had the idea that Mathematics ought to be topological right from the start. And that's a reason uh, now to, be, to see if there is something uh, interesting for us in this, because we have had again a proposal of this kind now from Wojewodski uh, to base um, mathematics, uh, to have as a foundation for mathematics a topological framework, more precisely a homotopy uh, theoretic framework. Uh, I do not think myself uh, that uh, we can start from topology. I mean, topology ha has, to my mind, to be built up by means of some kind of set theory, some kind of more basic foundational framework. But we have at least these two serious proposals uh, for the other point of view. Now, um, Later on, in one of his very last papers from 54, he introduced the notion of dressed spread. Now, that uh, has no difference in meaning from what he called spread earlier on. It's just con convenient because the definition of spread consists of two parts to call the first part something, and then in the second part you arrive at by adding something, and that's the dressing. Uh, he didn't himself call the first part uh, naked spread. That, was, uh, that term was introduced by Heiting in his little book, Intuitionism and Introduction, but only in the second edition from 1966, whereas the first edition is from 56. And then uh, Trostra introduced in 69 um, an alternative to naked, namely undressed spread. And uh, that's particularly appropriate nowadays because if you try to Google naked <laughs> spread, you get nothing about pornography. I mean, <laughs> with dressed spread, you can still get browser and all the rest, but with naked spread, it's impossible. So, a dressed spread is a naked spread plus something more. So, what then is a naked spread? Well, a naked spread is just a tree. Uh, with the well-known picture that I have drawn uh, here. And um, if the tree uh, is completely arbitrary, well, then if we start from the root, if we have to uh, branch uh, over some, uh, if you prefer, well, I would say, I say set nowadays, but if you prefer type, uh, understand me as a type. So it branches over some set capital A1, and then we make a choice from A1, little A1, and then it branches over a new set A2, which depends, of course, on the previous choice A1, and so on, ad infinitum. Well, that means that the, the spread is really given by this uh, uh, 
infinite sequence uh, of sets A1, A2, depending on the previous X1, etc. And uh, uh, that is now uh, quite uh, striking if, if you know something about uh, type theory, or if you uh, cut it off at, uh, at level N here and consider the first N clauses, that's exactly what is called the context, uh, the Lorentz term uh, independent uh, type theory. So it seems then that uh, um, there is a natural connection here with type theory right from the start, and that uh, we should be able somehow to define a naked spread as an infinite context. But of course it's a non-trivial thing to even if we have seen the pattern that you have with finite context of arbitrary length, it's still a very big step to introduce as a single mathematical object the whole infinite uh, context. So uh, let this be enough about the notion of a naked spread. <coughs> no, I should say, uh, sorry, I should say also that from a topological point of view, the naked spreads are too special uh, because uh, considered as a topological space, uh, namely the topological space whose neighborhoods are the finite branches starting from the root and whose points are the infinite branches. That's a topological space in the standard sense. But uh, these spaces have, have, have a very special neighborhood structure Namely, if, uh, if you take two neighborhoods, that is, two finite branches, either um, one is contained in the other, or else they are disjoint. So if you use uh, standard uh, Venn diagrams, it means that if you have two neighborhoods, U and V, either it looks like this, or it looks like this, V is included in U, or else uh, U and V are disjoint. So it's clear that there is a fourth case that is missing. The most important case is namely the U and D overlap. And uh, uh, that overlapping is impossible to uh, achieve uh, uh, with a tree. Uh, and this is why, uh, as a topological space, uh, the trees are too special by being always totally disconnected. Uh, topological terminology. So how do we introduce the connectedness? Well, that's the purpose of the dressing. Uh, and uh, I will put it this way. Uh, to the left we have a naked spread that is a tree, and then we have certain functions um, which are called T0, T1, T2, etc., uh, which are uh, defined um, on the nodes uh, in the naked tree uh, at the corresponding level, N. Uh, and the more natural notation would be to uh, maybe call them uh, S0, S1, etc. because S sub N is the standard notation for the partial sum of a series. And uh, you should think of the uh, um, T sub n here as the uh, sum of uh, x1 up to xn uh, in the uh, previous picture. So if we have such uh, functions defined, that means that uh, these, uh, let's call them summation functions, these summation functions will collapse some of the nodes at that level. Um, as you see in the uh, picture to the right here. So T1 causes, T0 and T1 causes no collapse, but in T2 the two middle nodes are already con con uh, collapsed into one node, so we get three points instead of four, and similarly uh, at the next level. And <coughs> in this particular case we have the full binary tree uh, to the left, and we have the uh, typical picture for a random walk. Uh, on the right, you go one step either to the left or to the right at each time point. Uh, now, if I had it taken which uh, is 
more interesting from a topological point of view. Um, the full ternary tree instead to the left, then I would have gotten a picture somewhat like this, but more delicate on the right, namely the picture of the real numbers between 0 and 1 in the signed digit representation, binary signed digit representation. So each digit is either plus 1, 0, or minus 1. That's why the ternary tree is used. Sorry, can I just ask, so what yeah. is the book? What kind of structure can the thing on the right be? I mean, is it just that we want maps that identify? Them? Exactly. Is it really just a family of sets that allow us to identify things that nodes in the tree? On the exactly. Tree? Exactly. And uh, so the whole point is that we need to form a quotient of the original sets, gamma 0, gamma 1, etc. And uh, the way uh, statisticians and physicists uh, make that quotienting is by having some functions defined on the underlying space and identify uh, points that have the same value of those functions. Uh, so, um, what happens then is that uh, if we start uh, with an infinite branch uh, a1, A2, etc., little a1, little a2, etc., from the naked spread, then um, uh, with that infinite branch will be associated uh, the elements uh, T0 of the empty sequence, T1 of the one element sequence, etc. Uh, and uh, we should think of uh, these uh, uh, Tn of A1 up to An as. Um, uh, formal neighborhoods. I mean, we shouldn't think of them set theoretically. It's, we think of them, in the case of real numbers, they would be rational intervals, uh, typically. And you needn't think of a rational interval as, as a set. It's just um, something symbolic that you write. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, the correct intuition is that uh, this uh, sequence in the naked spread, uh, A1, A2, etc., is like a kind of a generalized decimal expansion of the point that is given by this uh, shrinking sequence of neighborhoods. And for uh, uh, Brouwer, uh, a point of the space or the spread is by definition nothing but the shrinking sequence of neighborhoods. It's not anything beyond that. It is just <coughs> And that's what he called a uh, choice sequence. So Brouwer did not have a more structure than this. Uh, and to me, uh, to my mind, uh, it's a bit, um, a bit too weak a structure, too poor a structure. Uh, you, you should. We should say something more about these uh, uh, crucial functions, the dressing functions, T sub n. And um, for this, um, uh, I need to turn into some work in statistics, which has contributed precisely this. Uh, namely, there is a notion of repetitive structure, so the second uh, concept in the title. A notion of repetitive structure uh, that I introduced in 1973, I mean, I introduced the term. And you should think of a, a repetitive structure as a projective system of sample spaces. And on each of these sample spaces, you have a statistic defined. And so, so far, it looks just like uh, addressed spread. Uh, but then uh, um, these uh, statistics uh, defined on the uh, sets that form the projective limit, they have to be appropriately related to each other, uh, not be completely arbitrary. And the question is, uh, um, how is that defined properly, to be properly related? Now, I had a myself uh, 
a proposal for that in my original formulation, which was a combinatorial condition uh, which probabilistically could be expressed by saying that certain conditional probability distributions are uniform. But we can forget completely about that now because uh, Lauritsen, with whom I cooperated at the time, he found a completely uh, algebraic condition on these functions, uh, which implies uh, the condition that uh, I had uh, proposed. And so now we can forget completely about my original definition and instead look at this equation uh, which I propose to call uh, the Lauritsen equation, uh, which uh, he formulated in exactly this way, except for, for the last part there. Uh, and um, uh, this equation uh, is, um, has a very natural interpretation, I mean an interpretation that goes beyond it as a piece of pure mathematics, as pure mathematics is already there and I wouldn't say anything. But uh, the interesting thing is it's, uh, what it is that it captures. And uh, um, I could phrase it in the following way. Uh, think of the sequence uh, x1, x2, etc. from the naked spread as incoming data. And uh, at each uh, stage n, you um, don't uh, retain all that information x1 up to xn, you only retain uh, the information tn of x1 up to xn. So it's some uh, functions of the data that you uh, retain. Uh, and then when you have a new piece of incoming data xn plus 1, then you need to update uh, this uh, uh, sum, within quotes, the tn of x1 up to xn, with the new data xn plus 1. And uh, that's what these psi functions do. So take in the case when m is equal to 1, then you will have psi sub n of 1 uh, will update uh, tn to tn plus 1. And then it continues like this. So this means that you get um, um, yeah, another good terminology here is to think of tn of x1 up to uh, xn as what you remember of x1 up to xn. So um, you can't remember all this uh, massive amount of incoming data that you have. You remember only some few characteristics of it. Some in the first place, usually. Uh, but uh, as you know from ordinary contingency tables or something, you, it's not just uh, one quantity in general. You will have all the row sums and all the column sums in a contingency table, so there will be the statistic T will have several components uh, in general. Uh, so um, it's what you retain in memory, and then uh, when, you, when time passes, that is, you go to the next stage, then your picture of the past become, can only become more blurred. I mean, something that you have already lost in your memory, is, you won't get back. But, of course, as time passes, your memory of the past gets even, blurred, even more blurred. Uh, and it's this um, blurring that the uh, psi functions uh, effectuate. It seems this could be very of naturality. Uh, you mean uh, in factorial terms? Yes. Oh, very good, because I will rephrase. Maybe you will see the natural transformations then when I show the factorial <laughs> formulation of it. Now, um, I want to uh, show uh, the same uh, data in a diagrammatic form. So now, as I said um, in the uh, upper corner here, <coughs> These psi functions are really de uh, de entirely determined by the case when the second index is 1, because then they get composed and you 
get uh, uh, any value of n. So in this diagram now you have at the nodes uh, contacts in the sense of type theory. And uh, uh, the uh, edges um, or the arrows between the nodes are contextual mappings, which is the same as substitutions in uh, type theory. And uh, all the uh, uh, maps which point uh, southwest, they are uh, projections uh, on, an, on an initial part of the, uh, the context in question. And that's visible, I think, at each, everywhere here, that they are um, projections on an initial part. And then the uh, arrows that go in the uh, south east, in the direction southeast, they are the uh, psi functions, the updating <laughs> functions that I showed. And uh, um, look at the lowest line here, you see you have the... Uh, so in this picture I have called psi sub n 1, that is when n is equal to 1, I call it with a single index n plus 1 instead. So then you have the function psi 1 here, psi 2, psi 3, etc. And this whole diagram is actually generated by the zigzag that you have at the bottom here whenever you have two, um, two different incoming arrows, you fill the diamond. Uh, so in, in this case you fill the diamond like this, and then here you fill this diamond, etc. The whole diagram gets uh, generated from the uh, zigzag at the bottom. And uh, the um, updating functions, uh, Tn, are the functions that are created uh, um, from from this line, where you have the uh, um, data from the native spread um, down to this line, where you have the uh, uh, values, value sets T0, T1, etc., of your uh, statistics or memory functions, T sub n. So here you get the mapping from the empty context to T0, here from the uh, gamma 1, context of length 1, down to T1, and here from gamma 2, down to T2, etc. Uh, and uh, each such function is a composition of the appropriate uh, psi functions. So this is a composition of psi 2 with psi 1 with psi 0, which is just constantly equal to star. The star here is just the starting point. Uh, some, uh, point of T0 from which you start. Now the same diagram I'm now going to draw in a more condensed form. Um, so we are in the typical situation in computer science that you see a pattern. It's very easy to explain what pattern is when you can use the three dots. And uh, here, where are the three dots? Well, it's here, of course. Uh, it continues at infinitum here. And it well do, however precise, however good understanding you have of this general pattern, uh, to be able to write down in closed form the equations uh, defining it is a non trivial thing. And uh, that's what I would be concerned with now. And the first step in that direction is to replace the previous diagram by uh, this one. It shows the same um, information, but uh, in a new notation now. Uh, so, uh, T sub uh, upper 0, upper 1, etc. Uh, that's now a whole context. Uh, so, um, really, you should, should think of it as capital TOR, uh, but capital TOR looks the same. But the upper index makes it clear. I have in mind now a whole context, uh, T sub 
uh, n. And then uh, um, uh, up here, you have the naked uh, spread as before, uh, gamma 0, gamma 1, etc. And then uh, you have the intermediate nerve here, and remember from the previous diagram that an intermediate nerve, like this one for instance, uh, has an initial T part, uh, in this case T0, and then a certain number of X variables. And it's those X variables that are that I use the notation, uh, in this case, gamma sub zero and upper two, up, the upper two that are in the case two x variables, and the zero indicates that it's over t zero. Uh, yeah? Can the projection function be thought of as a dual of context expansion? Yes. Uh, whenever you make a context longer, you have a projection yeah. from the longer to right. the longer. So So now I've already introduced an equation here that uh, turns out to be uh, workable for writing down the definition of all this in closed form. And uh, when doing that, I shall make a generalization, name, which is quite essential, namely, not only consider the case of an ordinary sequence uh, indexed by 0, 1, 2, 3, etc., but I will replace that by an arbitrary indexing category. And uh, funnily enough, um, because these indices are indices of context, it turns out to be very helpful to use a formulation of the notion of category, which is not the usual one. Uh, and that's because um, they are going to index context, so it's better that the category has a structure which is as close as possible to the structure that the contacts have. And that can be achieved in a very simple way. I mean, instead of having objects with uh, the morphism as usual, in the usual category, uh, we can have instead uh, uh, objects, and for just a single uh, object, we have the objects over that single object. Okay. So instead of two here, we have only one. Uh, and uh, moreover, I'm going to uh, call these objects uh, indices, when we use capital I for that, and uh, this will be I over. Uh, and I'm going to change from uh, the standard letters here also to. Uh, to use I here for since I'm thinking of it as an index, an object I call I, and then I will have indices over I here. So the picture is this that uh, if we have an object that is an index I and we have an outgoing arrow from I, let's call it J, uh, then I draw this picture and uh, I plus J is simply the program name. Uh, of this outgoing arrow from I. And uh, then you formulate the usual, uh, the obvious uh, associativity and uh, unit laws. And then, lo and behold, this turns out to be equivalent in a reformulation of the notion of, of category. And the uh, uh, unit, instead of the unit law, we will have an index, we have an index I. Uh, then there is an outgoing arrow from I, which we call them zero I naturally, such that I plus zero I you get back to I. That's of course just the identity arrows in the category uh, which have become zeros instead. And the reason why this is, it's, I think it's unavoidable to go over to this notation at some stage, and that is because uh, the uh, beginning of Time, the origin, which will be the beginning of time, um, has, after all, to be the initial. That's where we begin. So it has to be the initial object of the category rather than the terminal object, as it has, as it is, if you use the standard formulation. Uh, <coughs> and hence, 
to get the units to come up to the zero in this way. How, how do you represent the composition? That's my addition. Oh, I see. I thought. Oh. So, hi. Yes. You, you seem to say that I plus J was the code name. I don't know if this understood that. Uh, I plus J is the kernel map, yes, and you should, that's the notation I use for I plus J. Oh, sorry, uh, you asked about uh, morphism composition. Yes, yes. Well, that would be, you have two morphism J and J, then J is to I plus J, and there's another morphism J here, going to I plus J plus J. Uh, then there will be a morphism composition uh, which makes J plus K, which is also an outgoing morphism from I, and whose curve domain equals the equals um, this. So that's morphism composition. Um, now this is just a positive law. Sorry. So it's an associative Yes, an associative analysis. So um, this is to, meant to help the formulation of this. And moreover, the use of these, uh, both the upper and lower indices, uh, are meant to help in approximately the same way as one is helped in, in um, uh, the uh, index notation Oh, sorry, no, the time is taking. Uh, yeah, the tensor calculus uh, index notation. I mean, th this is not real tensor calculus, of course, but it uses somehow the advantages of the upper and lower in indices. <coughs> so now comes the um, uh, general definition of uh, this structure that we had before with the indices generalized from being an ordinary sequence to an arbitrary index category. So uh, capital I are the objects of the index category, as I said, and um, uh, gamma I and Ti are contexts, so CTX is a bit of a for context. The psi upper I's correspond to the so if you remember these functions P sub n in the Lauritsen's notation, I changed the index to uh, this kind of notation and uh, it's more simply for logical reasons that it's better to denote them uh, this way, it's more systematic. So these psi functions are nothing but the previous uh, TM functions. And then we have these uh, contexts that appeared in the diagram with uh, both upper and lower indices. Gamma lower i upper j is a context over ti, over the context that we have 